John McDougall is a guy who saves lives. He has a cure for gout, constipation, cancer, heart disease, arthritis, auto, autoimmune diseases, and a lot more. It's called a starch-based diet, and it works a whole lot better than what most other doctors have to offer. 16 years ago, my wife Sabrina was diagnosed with a rare autoimmune disease called relapsing polychondritis. 40% of the people who get the diagnosis she got are dead in 10 years. Uh, those who are still alive generally have a lot of problems due to the drugs that are used to treat the symptoms of the disease. But Sabrina found Dr. McDougall's diet and she decided to give it a try. We all gave it a try. Uh, she started the diet when she had her monthly rheumatologist appointment. Uh, it was three weeks after we started the diet. For the first time, her sed rate was normal. In a year, for the first time, her the anti-nuclear antibodies, which is an indirect measure how they see the disease, weren't present in her blood. And after three months of going back and getting that same result, Dr. Rodney Bluestone, her rheumatologist, said, you're in remission. Except he's, he's English. He said, you're in remission. <laughs> and he said, and your dietary strategy is working because your cholesterol is only 135. So that was 16 years ago. And we haven't never looked back. Dr. McDougall has saved other members of my family. And I like to think that a lot of doctors, you know, they act like they're God, but that's just an act. But Dr. McDougall, <laughs> Dr. McDougall is in fact Dr. God in our book. And it's a great honor and a pleasure to have him here and to be able to introduce him. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John McDougall. So let me tell you how all this got started. As I mentioned, Mary and I have been together for 41 years now. It was the greatest gift God ever gave me was my friendship with Mary. People were talking at the lunch table today, they said it must have been a really tough life. Well, it was, but we had fun. Uh, one of the things I promised her, and, and still promise her for the next, next 20 or 30 years, I hope, is that uh, she'll never be bored. <laughs> she might not always be happy, but she's never bored, and I'm sure she feels the same way coming to meet all you today. What an exciting day for her to meet all you folks and to, uh, you know, just to have a good time together. We have so much fun together. But anyway, it, it started out in Grand Rapids, Michigan in 1971. She was a surgical nurse and I was a medical student and we met and I fell in love and it only took me about a week and a half before I convinced her to go out with me and she finally did and uh, she's found something worthwhile and has stuck with me since. <clears throat> but in the process we were in Grand Rapids, Michigan and I don't know how you feel about Michigan but that was one of the best decisions I ever made was to leave. <laughs> and we left, we left after medical school and we went to we just wanted to get away. And I think it was the time in life, not that Michigan's so such a terrible place. I mean, there's, if you live in California, you probably know the difference. But uh, we wanted to get out of there, and so we left and we went as far as we could possibly go. And where we met, went was to Hawaii. And we went to Hawaii in 1972. I did my internship there. We fell in love with Hawaii. We didn't want to leave, but I didn't want to continue being a doctor. I actually hated being a doctor. And the reason I hated being a doctor is I could see no place for me in helping people. I just, I just didn't see it. And of course, that all changed as time went on. And I can tell you, I love being a doctor. I think that being a doctor is the, the, the best thing anybody could be. As when I was growing up, my dad taught me some very important lessons. And one of them was the joy in life comes from helping other people. And uh, one of the best opportunities to help other people was to be a doctor. And all that kind of translated in my life. But where I was at that time, I couldn't see it. And I didn't want to be a physician anymore. But I finished my internship, and I was looking for a job, and I got a job on the Big Island of Hawaii as a sugar plantation doctor. And that's what really changed my life. Between 1973 and 1976, I was a general practitioner in Honoka'a, Hawaii, which is on the Big Island, and I worked on a sugar plantation taking care of 5,000 people. I caught their babies. I pronounced them dead. I did brain surgery in the middle of the night. I did whatever it took to take care of these 5,000 people. I was basically it. I learned uh, two things from that experience that changed my life. One is I learned that uh, I was fallible in terms of being a physician. I thought being a doctor, you could do, as Jeff introduced me, things next to God. And my performance was far, far from being next to God. 
My patients did horrible. I took care of these people with chronic problems like blood pressure and constipation, indigestion and heart disease. I gave them the best treatments that I had been taught and uh, they never responded the way I'd expected. They never got well. And I blamed it on myself. I thought I was a terrible doctor. I did that for three years and I was about ready to quit except I had another decision I could have made and that was to go back and learn how to be a good doctor. And so instead of quitting after three years as a general practitioner, I went back into training at the University of Hawaii in, uh, internal medicine residency program. But before I left, I learned the second lesson that uh, has carried me through today and why I can talk to you with confidence about what I believe to be true. I had a chance to take care of 5,000 people. They were first, second, third, and fourth generation Filipinos, Japanese, Chinese, and Koreans. The first generation moved from their native lands to the Big Island of Hawaii to start a new life on the sugar plantation. With them, they took their initial education. What you learn as a child, you keep the rest of your life, basically. And so they learned to diet of rice and vegetables. They came to the Big Island. They work on the sugar plantation. Their kids who were raised on the sugar plantation, they learned more Western ways. We had Texas drive-in up the hill, so they were able to get their burgers. The first McDonald's arrived in Hilo, Hawaii in 1973. Or 19, uh, 1973, I was one of their first and best customers. I saw the kids get a little fatter and a little sicker, and by the time we got to the grandkids of these immigrants, they were just as fat and just as sick as everybody else. That taught me two things. Genes are irrelevant in terms of heredity. And uh, second of all, it wasn't inevitable to get sick and fat as you got older, because I saw my first generation patients staying trim, hardy, healthy into their 80s and 90s. The uh, stark difference was in what they ate. My first generation lived on rice and vegetables. They had no dairy. If the chicken lost the cockfight on Saturday, they had chicken. Otherwise, they had no chicken. And their kids became, you know, became more balanced in their diet. They started eating a well-balanced dairy, meat, protein, calcium diet, and they got fat and sick. So it was obvious. After three years, I went back into training to become a board-certified internist, which I did accomplish. I'm a board-certified internist. After that, uh, I pretty much dedicated my life to taking care of people by dietary changes. Uh, I've taken care of, in a live-in patient situation where people live in one of my institutions, which at one time was at St. Lena Hospital and now is up in Santa Rosa, I've taken care of over 5,000 people that I've personally taken care of. I've, I know their sicknesses, I know their medications, I know their private treatments, I know their suffering, and I've seen most of them get well. To varying degrees, depending upon how they follow the prescription that I offered. So I have that kind of experience behind me, in addition to the fact that I, I have a passion for the scientific literature. Uh, in medicine, knowledge is power. Like if you're a banker, money is power. If you're a real estate person, property is power. If you're in medicine, knowledge is power. And so as a doctor, you want to learn things so you can get power. You know, it's the pecking order. And I became passionate about the scientific literature once I saw what was going on. Prior to that, I had no interest. As I told you, I didn't even want to be a doctor. But once I saw the problem, and once I saw the solution, I wanted to know everything. I wanted to know about heart surgery. I wanted to know about cancer therapy. I wanted to know about arthritis. I wanted to know about multiple sclerosis. Mary reads novels. I read scientific journals. That's my passion. I know it sounds weird, but that's what I love to do. And I've done this, well, since 1970, since 1977. I've had that fetish. <laughs> what can I do? Okay, so I went into practice in Hawaii. I practiced there until 1986. In 1986, St. Helena Hospital, which is in the Napa Valley, invited me to run my program as a live-in program at St. Helena Hospital. I moved there with my family in 19, 1987. We moved to California. One of the best moves I ever made. I love California, I have no plans on leaving. And I ran my program at St. Lena Hospital amongst bypass surgeons and cardiologists for 16 years. It was a great experience. I am a little ashamed to tell you why I lasted for 16 years. 
The reason I stayed there 16 years is I felt I needed credibility. I needed to rub elbows with the real doctors. And it took me almost 16 years to learn the truth, and that is that they were holding me back. They were an embarrassment. They were violating the oath that I took when I became a doctor. And so I quit after 16 years. I had a patient who was actually from St. Little Hospital that was there there in those times, who was with, in my program last week, and she said, well, the rumor is they say, ran you out. They didn't run me out. I left there because I was too embarrassed to stay any longer. And let me tell you the setting. <clears throat> I was taking care of people. I took care of, uh, I took care of over 3,000 people when I was at St. Helena Hospital. Myself, I personally took care of them. They were my patients. <clears throat> and we had phenomenal results. In fact, we published the results in the scientific journals, and people did very well. But one of the problems I had at St. Helena Hospital was I, it was hard for me to get people to come to the program. And I didn't realize why. Part of the reason is the patients were smarter than I was, was they knew that you didn't go to a hospital to get well. And so they stayed away. But I stayed there and tried to build that program for 16 years. And I had a great staff and I met some wonderful people and there's some wonderful doctors there. But their motivation was to treat people. 80% of that hospital's business came from the treatment of heart disease. There was one time they asked me to donate to build a cath lab. I said, you know, you really aren't listening to me, are you? The final straw came uh, when I was trying to build the program, I was trying to build the census, the population, to, you know, to build the reputation of St. Lena Hospital, which by the way is an Adventist hospital. One of the uh, principles behind Adventist living is a vegetarian diet. I am not an Adventist, but I am kind of an honorary Adventist in terms of my belief in diet and lifestyle. So what happened was uh, I made a good friend, his name is Dr. Roy Swank, he was the head of Oregon Health and Science University's neurology department for 23 years, and he invented the treatment of multiple sclerosis with a healthy diet. I had known him for almost 20 years and he was getting very old. He was probably 96, 95 years old at that time, and he wanted somebody to carry on his work. So I said, great. We'd already run two diet and MS programs at St. Lena Hospital. I said, great, this is just a natural what I will do, and I signed a legal agreement with him, as I said, what we will do is we'll bring the Swank diet into St. Lena Hospital, and we will care for these sick people at St. Lena Hospital. I said, it's a natural. We need more people. You are an Adventist hospital. You believe in diet and lifestyle. I mean, it, what could be more natural? And so I went to the head of my health department, and I said, uh, I would like to bring multiple sclerosis patients into our program. And she thought about it for a little bit, and she told me, we won't do that. And I said, why won't you do that? And her response was something to the effect that we don't want the stigma. You don't want the stigma. No, MS patients don't get well. But what she was really telling me, there was no money in it. You can't make money on teaching people how to be well. So I uh, had my contract coming up five days later, and I'd been there 16 years, and I wrote in capital letters, void. And prior to me doing that, I asked for a uh, meeting with the head of the hospital, Jolene Olson. I asked for a meeting with her to discuss the predicament I was in, because I knew it couldn't go beyond the head of my department believing that we shouldn't take needy people into a hospital. I could not get an appointment for a month and a half. Once I wrote void on the contract, I had an appointment the next day. And I said, tell me why I should stay. And they could tell me no reason, so I left. That was one of my other great decisions. We run the program in Santa Rosa Hospital as a spa, in a spa and resort. Our census immediately doubled, and it's four times what it ever was at the hospital. Because, because it's not a hospital, I guess in part. Anyway, that's, uh, that's how I got to where I am today. I, at uh, 65 years old, take care of myself personally. <clears throat> full-time care for somewhere between 45 and 55 people per session. When I can't do that anymore, I'm going to give it up. And uh, fortunately, I have a son who just became a board-certified internist last week. And there are also a lot of other young doctors who will be moving in and taking a place on taking care of people by proper care. The problem is, is money. The problem is, is how do you make a living doing the right thing? And you can make a living doing the wrong thing easily, doing heart surgery, passing out drugs to people. But that's a wrong thing. That's a moral dilemma, at least that I've had all along. 
How do you make money doing the right thing? <clears throat> and I put together some proposals on how to do it. But I'm going to tell you today on, on how to do it. But first, I want to address the, uh, the problem. We have a, a very serious problem in this country with diet. And good people have tried to address it. They've tried to make it right so that we have a healthier country, a country that can thrive. We have a very sick country now. Regardless of your politics, any, anybody who runs this country is facing a massive problem. That is, they're dealing with a whole population of fat, sick people. It, it is so bad that even though the USDA has made some efforts to try and get our country healthier with the dietary guidelines and the school lunch program, they have failed. They don't understand what the problems are and what the solutions are, even though they've tried to get, do things like get people to eat less fat and more vegetables. They've failed. Has anybody seen this new video out about the starving children in our school system? Kids are starving based on the USDA guidelines. The USDA guidelines for the lunch program specify that children will not be allowed to eat more than one cup of starch per week per child. The WIC program, which is for women, infant, and children, the WIC program, at least last year, I haven't looked at their current policies, the WIC program, which gives coupons to needy people to buy food, will let people buy bacon bits and cheese whizzes, but you cannot buy a potato. That is one food that is restricted from the WIC program. So because of uh, the misguidance, the good intentions, the misguidance, what we have is we have a, a country of people who don't understand what to do and how to get well. What they're trying to do is feed our children and maybe our military someday and to get you to eat more vegetables. And your response is, I don't feel good. I'm tired. I have no energy. The kids are starving to death because they restrict the source of energy that you need to function well, and that is starch. <clears throat> We have to agree upon a few things. I know there's some of you who don't like my approach, don't like my style, and certainly don't like my message, but that's okay. I'm not here to win a popularity contest. One thing that all of us can agree on in this room is we must eat. The second thing I think we can agree on is the reason we eat, we eat for energy. You, know, you don't eat for protein, you have no desire for protein, you have no desire for beta carotene, or any other phytonutrient, et cetera, what you eat for is energy. You have three potential sources of energy from your food. You can get energy from protein, which the body only does under duress. If you do something bizarre like eat the Atkins diet, you gotta, eat, you gotta burn protein, you gotta turn it into energy because you don't have any carbohydrate. So you can get energy from protein, you can get energy from fat, and fat is a usable source of energy, but that's not the purpose of fat. Fat serves as the metabolic dollar that is saved for the day when the famine occurs, which hasn't occurred here in this country at this time. So I know a lot of you have been saving. <laughs> okay, so you've got protein, which the body uses to build things. It rarely turns into energy unless you're starving to death or do something bizarre, like eating one of these very low-carb diets. So protein's off. You can pick fat, which is stored for future use. It is burned, you know, the body burns a little bit, of not much. <clears throat> the primary source of energy for the body is sugar, carbohydrate. Uh, you remember your high school biology lessons taught you about glycolysis, how the body burns glucose for energy. That's, that's the energy for people. So here's the problem. <clears throat> is that uh, people need energy, and uh, they look to these potential sources for energy. What everybody knows in this country is you're supposed to get protein, and you're supposed to get calcium, and that means you're supposed to eat meat, and you're supposed to eat dairy. And so that's what you've chosen for energy. Now some wise guy like me comes along and tells you you're not supposed to eat meat and dairy. And your response is, I'm going to starve to death because you don't know any other source of energy. You're afraid to eat sugar. You're afraid to eat starch. Starches make you fat. Everybody knows starch makes you fat. Everybody knows not to eat rice because rice makes you fat, and that's why there are 1.73 billion obese Asians living on rice. <laughs> All right, 
So, so the problem is, is people don't understand that we're star cheaters. Always have been. I told you that in the last lecture. Always, the body's not going to change. We're not going to also all of a sudden become able to live off the wrong source of fuel. So starch is our food, always has been, should be. But people fear starch. They stay away from it. When I ask them, or anybody asks them to give up meat and dairy, which, by the way, fat and protein mean meat and dairy. You all understand that. By purpose, the USDA does not put in the dietary guidelines the terms that would cause Americans to act. They don't vilify meat and dairy. They don't use those words. They use saturated fat and cholesterol. And you have no idea what a saturated fat and cholesterol looks like. You've never grown one in your garden. You never looked at one in your plate. You have no idea what that is. But if they told you in the U.S. dietary guidelines that fat and protein mean dairy and meat, then you might act, and that could be a serious consequence to agribusiness. So the problem is, is that uh, people don't understand that they're supposed to eat starches. They're afraid of starches, and so they don't have a chance to get well. And that's why our children are starving to death right now, and they really are because of the new school lunch program. If the children were told, and I just watched this video over the last couple of days several times, if children were told that uh, they're starch eaters, if they ate starch, then their balls would move and they'd win the races, you realize that uh, all the long distance endurance uh, winners for the Olympics since 1968 have been this, from the same part of the world. All long distance endurance races in the Olympics since 1968 have been won by the Kenyans and Ethiopians. And you know what their diet is? It's a diet of starch, of corn, of potatoes, of various kinds of grains. If the kids realized that they would win on the track, they would win in the class, they wouldn't have to suffer the acne, the pimples, the constipation, the stomach pains. If they would realize that they'd win the races, they'd be the best basketball players and football players, et cetera, if they could just get the food right, don't you think the kids would go for it? Well, there's one thing I don't want you to tell the kids, though. Uh, remember, I'm the father of three and the grandfather of five, and so I know about kids. Don't tell them about precocious puberty. Because the kids will uh, react in a direction you don't expect. You see, the diet we feed people today causes the children to develop precocious puberty. 3% uh, of the black girls in this country, 3% of the black girls in this country, age three, are developing breasts and pubic hair. 50% of the black girls in this country at age eight are going through puberty. White girls, it's about, uh, it's about a year later. Boys, it's you know, about a year or so later. The, the kids are going through uh, precocious puberty as a consequence of the food we're feeding them. Of course, if you've had kids, you know that they want to shave and you know, the whole thing when they're kids. So don't tell them about that part, that they won't mature <clears throat> until they're ready to reproduce. You know, the, the way, at the age people are supposed to have become parents, they won't get those abilities, those desires, until they get to be 16, 17, 18 years old if they eat like I recommend. Right now, the children are going through pu puberty. They're sexually mature at age 10, 11, or 12. They're able to have babies, and they do. So we have teenage pregnancies, we have early initiation of sexual activity, higher rates of venereal disease, uh, mothers dropping out of school, unable to advance themselves in life because of the pregnancies that result. Your kids, instead of thinking about checkers and riding bicycles and learning their math, are thinking about sex. Why would you expect otherwise? You know what those feelings are. Well, if you take little children who are 8, 9, 10, 11 years old, and you give them sexual desires and functions of 18, 19, 20-year-olds, what do you think you have? You have chaos in our society. Anyway, you can tell the kids the rest of the stuff. Just don't tell them about that part. Uh, it, it is a disaster. And what bothers me so much, and it caused me to get so upset that I wrote uh, Governor Scott in Florida. Uh, Governor Scott in Florida this April uh, uh, put out a uh, notice that there would no longer be a tolerated child abuse or knowledge of child abuse. If uh, somebody was aware of child abuse and they did not report it, they would be liable to a huge fine and jail sentence. That's what Governor Scott, a Republican governor from Florida, uh, passed as a bill. Well, heck, I'm licensed in Florida. I got a medical license. So you know I had to react. 
So I wrote Governor Scott a, uh, a letter that I sent to all of you. If you get my newsletter, it's free, no gimmicks. It's on my website. I wrote Governor Scott a newsletter. I told him that there's a, a tremendous amount of child abuse going on in our country, causing 30% uh, of the kids to be overweight and obese, causing them to have acne, precocious puberty, stomach pains, headaches, and so on. This terrible child abuse that, by the way, if it was inflicted by a brutal man with a stick, it would cause that man to go to jail and everybody would be happy about it. This child abuse is caused by food that we're feeding our kids. And the perpetrators are almost everybody. It's McDonald's and Kroger's and Kentucky Fried Chicken and Safeway and you and I, if we don't know better. Nice people abuse children without knowledge. Policemen abuse children. Teachers abuse children. Doctors abuse children with a fork and spoon. The pain for the child is just as great as if it was, in, if it was inflicted by a stick. So anyways, I sent Governor Scott this complaint about child abuse, and I told him I was just doing my duty and tried to protect my medical license, and I have not heard back from him yet. <laughs> but that's the greatest, the greatest source of child abuse that goes on in the world today is the American diet. Challenge me if you think I'm wrong. Now, one of the qualities of civilized people is civilized people uh, protect the less fortunate, the less able to protect themselves. Civilized people do that. That's part of being civilized. Excuse me, what are we doing with the children? Who's protecting the children? So, anyway, we've got, we've got some serious problems in this country, and the problems, the food, the solution is simple. Kids need to understand that they get energy and bowel movements and clear skin and so on if they eat potatoes and rice and beans and corn and that meat and dairy make them fat and sick and disgusting and they stink bad and it's just horrible and they're not told that. So this can be fixed. But it won't be. I, I just, I, I, I'd step back and say, okay, you know, you're over 21. You can be fat and sick if you want but you cannot do that to children. And I would think that uh, people would act, but they won't. So how are we gonna fix this problem? <clears throat> you gotta go where the money is. That's what you gotta, you gotta go where the money is. And this is where I'm dedicating my time and effort and with minimal success, but maybe you can help me. The money's in the sickness businesses. And that amounts to 17% of the gross national product in this country is dealing with sickness 75% of that sickness is chronic disease, and most of that is due to eating. Yeah, some cigarettes, some alcohol, some illicit drug use, but most of it's the food. So here's this great big gold mine of cash to tap into, that anybody who's smart enough will do it, and so powerful enough and gutsy enough to stand up against everybody else. Here's how you do it. I'm going to share with this to you in case any of you want to do it. It's fine. I just like to get it done. So here's how you do it. What you do is you set up a new insurance company, like Blue Cross or Kaiser. You set up a new insurance company. And what you do is, and it's going to take a little money. It's going to take some powerful people to do this. What you do is you set up this insurance company. We, we did it. We had an organization to do it. We've done it on, uh, well, partially on three occasions. I did it in 2000 with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota. I took care of their patients, their employees of Blue Cross Blue Shield in Minnesota. Shows you the same results that we get. Plus, we dropped their health care costs based upon their health claims data by 44%. We did it for public supermarkets for a little while, too. And right now, we're doing it for Whole Foods Market. The initial part of it we're doing, and that is to try and get the patient population healthy. But it has to go further than that. You really have to get the money. You have to get control of the doctors and the medical system. If you don't, you're not going to win. So here's how you set up the system. It's OK if I tell them this, Mary. This is your fortune. You know, I'm going to give them all the secrets. This is how you do it. Is you set up a system where, uh, uh, where, where you're a dictator, where you're in charge, where you're the czar. Somebody has to be the dictator. I volunteer to be the dictator. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the dictates go like this, is that uh, number one, this is the way you save money immediately. I've told Whole Foods this. I've told other people this. You stop treating people with tests and treatments that have been proved to be harmful. Just stop that. That's all you do. Like I met with Kaiser this year, and I told the president of Kaiser in our town, if you just stop doing the PSA tests, 
Just stop recommending the prostate-specific antigen tests for men to detect prostate cancer. You'd save millions, probably billions of dollars. Just stop that test. Why should they stop it? Well, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force says stop it. The Canadian and English, English governments recommend their doctors not test this PSA test. Every organization in medicine, save for those that represent the doctors, recommends against PSA test. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, the uh, American College of Physicians, which are internists, the American College of Preventive Medicine, the American Cancer Society, and on and on and on, say, do not get PSA tests. You know what I'm talking about, the blood tests to detect prostate cancer in men. Why? Because you find a whole bunch of disease that would never bother people. And the disease you find is already too late to treat. You can't cure this cancer that's already aggressive. So you're submitting you know, 10 million men to an unnecessary test that's going to do nothing but harm, and everybody knows it. Now, I told you there's an exception. The American Urologic Association, which represents the interests of urologists and oncologists, 16,500 of them, recommend PSA testing. Okay, so what you do, first of all, is you stop allowing things to be done to your patients. I mean, any doctor should feel this way. But you can imagine a healthcare system that has the bottom line invested, like Kaiser. You know, they collect the premiums. If they don't have to spend them, it's just a bu big bucket load of money for them. So what you do is you stop doing things that are wrong. So you stop PSA testing. You recommend uh, one colon examination at age 60, a sigmoid, short little tube, at most. You stop mammograms. You stop mammograms. Mammograms will be stopped, by the way. Just write this down in your note. Dr. McDougall said that within three years, mammograms will be just like PSA tests. All major organizations will tell women not to get them because they do far more harm than good. This year, the Cochrane Collaboration came out the first time this year. They put out their recommendations and brochures in 13 languages that tell women to not get mammograms and to tell doctors to stop recommending them. You may not know who the Cochrane Collaboration is, this involves 28,000 scientists and doctors from around the world. It's the most respected, unbiased organization, authority on medicine in the world, the Cochrane Collaboration is. And this year they said, stop getting mammograms. The U.S. Preventive Service Task Force said last year, two years ago, to stop doing breast self-examination. So just write it in a note. Dr. McDougall says within three years, just like prostate, that women will be told not to get mammograms. All right, so here we're a health organization. We stop doing uh, harmful tests to people like PSAs and mammograms. We do maybe one sigmoid at age 60 on people. Uh, what else silly things do they do? Uh, anyway, there, there are a whole bunch of silly things that, that we do to make money. And then what we do is when it comes to treatments, we listen to the scientific research on what the treatments do. For example, I told you I was working on a law, and I'm still working on this, by the way, in Sacramento on uh, getting a law passed that will force physicians to tell patients that heart surgery doesn't save lives. So as a health care provider interested in my patients and the outcome, I will stop virtually every angioplasty for anybody that signs up or bypass surgery for almost everybody that signs into my program. Why? Because all the research says it does not prolong lives. It relieves symptoms at best, but these surgeries do not prolong lives in people with chronic coronary artery disease, which is the vast majority of people who have heart surgery have chronic coronary artery disease. I'm not even talking about changing their diet. Excuse me, I haven't even mentioned about dietary change. I'm just talking about doing the right thing for your patients. So you stop, uh, stop doing uh, angiograms and uh, angioplasties and bypass surgery. Oh, you think this is a unique idea? Well, in 2006, the COURAGE study came out, which showed there was no survival advantage from doing angioplasty. And in 2007, the OAT study came out and showed the same thing. In 2007, uh, the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology wrote recommendations to cardiologists to stop doing heart surgery on people with chronic disease. They wrote those recommendations. <clears throat> in uh, 2011, in the Archives of Internal Medicine, Doctors wrote an article about the impact of these recommendations in the Heart Association of the American College of Cardiology. The impact was none. There was no change in practice. And they said it's because of the money. Okay, so you can't count on doctors to do the right thing because the financial incentives are too great to do the wrong thing. But as a healthcare organization, 
whose uh, profits are based upon not doing treatments to people that hurt them, there's a whole bucket full of money for you. There's great reason to do the right thing. So you get this healthcare insurance company set up that stops doing things that are harmful. And, and you know, we're not just limited to heart surgery, and I told you about aggressive treatment of diabetes. All the studies show it kills. You think I'm kidding you? I mean, there's six major studies done on treating diabetics, type 2 diabetics, with aggressive therapy. All six show harm. The benefits are minor at best, and the, the last three that were published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2008 are clear. You have the ACCORD study, which is stopped 17 months early by the National Heart and Lung and Blood Institute because aggressive treatment by giving multiple shots of insulin and diabetic pills and multiple tests it dramatically increased the death and heart attacks of these people, so they stopped the study 17 months early. And then the advanced study came out just a month or so later. It showed no benefit to patients by aggressively treating them with diabetes. And then the veteran study came out the same year in the New England Journal of Medicine showing you increased risk of sudden death and those aggressively treated gained on average of 18 pounds as opposed to nine. Why would you give this kind of treatment to your insured? It makes no sense. These people need to be protected, but your insurance company right now pays for all that stuff, so you think it's good for you. Or why would they pay it? It would be financial suicide to do the wrong thing. They just don't get it. All right, so anyway, we stop giving uh, uh, harmful care to people. We do lumpectomies instead of radical mastectomies. Uh, we uh, insist on breastfeeding in infants as opposed to bottle feeding. And only under the most difficult situations do we help women who have to bottle feed. Otherwise, every woman realizes that breastfeeding is the only way to feed a child. We, uh, <laughs> these are simple things to do. <laughs> All right, uh, and then what we start doing is we deal with the problem. The problem is we got a whole bunch of sick people. Uh, remember that uh, two-thirds of the population of this country is overweight. The latest predictions are by 2030, let me say that again. Two-thirds of the population are overweight. One, 30% are obese. The current predictions are by 2030, 44% of the population of the U.S. will be obese. In states like Mississippi, they predict that 67% of the people will be obese. You expect our country to, to uh, create new jobs and to, to, to defend the country and, and to have functional families and society when everybody's sick? Okay, so we got these sick people. And what we do is we get them well. Instead of treating them, we get them well. And how do you get them well? You fix the problem. And the problem is the food. So you change their diet, and the people who have heart disease and angina, chest pain, chest pain goes away. We've known since the 1960s, if you take somebody who has chest pain, which is, by the way, one reason to do heart surgery if you have incapacity and chest pain. Heart surgery will relieve incapacity and chest pain some, you know, a lot of times. But we've known since the 1960s, if you put somebody on a low-fat diet, including Dean Arnish showed this, and Peter Quo, and many other investigators, you put them on a low-fat diet, chest pain goes away, and somewhere between 92 and 100% of the time. So we do that first. And that same diet reverses the underlying artery disease and gets them off their blood pressure pills and their cholesterol pills and makes their blood sugar normal and so on. That's what we do. So how do you get these people to do this? That's the problem. You see, there are all kinds of excuses that people come up for why the system I want to do won't work. They say, well, nobody will follow it. I don't believe that. I don't believe nobody will follow it. I believe that people have self-interest. They just be, need to be given correct information. Like when I was growing up, <clears throat> when you would go into the doctor's lounge, you had to cut the air because it was so thick from smoke from the doctors. Everybody used to smoke. Uh, we were told by the Surgeon General uh, in 1964, Terry Sullivan, I think his name was, or anyway, uh, he told us that cigarette smoking would kill you. And so what did we do? We quit smoking. I believe that if we tell people that eating uh, bacon and butter and brie will kill them, that they will change. I believe the vast majority of people will change because you know people want to have a good life. They want to enjoy their kids and their grandkids and work hard and look good. As I told you in the lecture this morning, I had a very serious conversation with my 38-year-old daughter who runs our program. And she is, she is gorgeous. I mean, she's a, a beautiful woman, strong, healthy, uh, and you know, you, you couldn't wish for 
for better health for your children than we have. And we were talking about her girlfriends, same age. And they run five miles a day. And they got a big butt. <laughs> and they look at her and they say, you must run 10 miles a day. She said, I don't ever run at all. I don't exercise a bit. I believe people will change if they know. I know people go for plastic surgery. They buy fancy cars. Uh, they do anything to look good. Anything to look. I mean, they, they will go on the Atkins diet to look good. They'll take diet pills and diet drinks. Uh, they have their stomachs cut out. Excuse me! Bariatric surgery is a growing business. They do anything to look good. I believe that. Men and women, teenagers especially. Oh, when I was a teenager, not a hair could be out of place. They would do, if you would just tell them the truth, all you have to do to look good is to eat potato enchiladas and oatmeal and hash browns and pasta and marinara sauce. That's all you got to do. They would flock to that answer. I know that. So you tell your insured population, okay, this is the way you get the benefits. You want the benefits? You want to look good? You want your balls to stop hurting? You want to stop taking this bag full of pills every day? This is what you need to do. I think most people would do it, especially if their doctor told them, especially if their doctor, he or she, looked good themselves. See, one of the major problems with doctors is they can't see beyond their dinner plate. <laughs> and as a consequence, they don't know how to get people well. And even if they do know, they know that nobody can do it because they can't. So once we get the doctors educated, the patients will be educated, and they will do it. Okay, you say they won't do it. All right, fine, you won't do it. No problem. You see Blue Cross Blue Shield, that's their phone number right there. You go sign up for their program. Not my program. You, you know, you go over to Aetna, you sign up for their program if you want to stay fat and sick. We want you to be healthy. Oh, well, we can't discriminate like that. I have to take all comers. Okay, fine. We'll take all comers, but uh, <clears throat> there's something called a, uh, uh, an extra premium. You see, if you're a drunk driver, Either you can't get driver's insurance, car insurance, or you pay extra. Yeah. If you decide to smoke, you can't get life insurance or health insurance, or you pay extra. Excuse me, you want to eat cheese and meat? No problem. But you're going to pay for it. Your premiums are going to reflect it. Oh, why should I pay... Why should I pay, what do we pay, $800 a month, Mary? $400 each a month? I'm like, that. I don't know. we're on Medicare. Jeez, I can imagine what it would be if we weren't. Why should I pay for people who want to eat themselves to death? I want to pay for if I got, you know, struck by lightning or hit by a car or, you know, got an, inf an infection or something. I want to pay for an accident. I don't want to pay for self-induced disease. And you shouldn't be asked to either. That's my new insurance company. And uh, what we do is we, we, teach, we teach people how to be well. You cannot do that. I, I wrote a whole newsletter in May 2012 about how doctors can transfer to a lifestyle-based practice. Because you think you're miserable, you should be a doctor. Can you, can you imagine what it would be like if you were an architect and all your bridges fell down? <laughs> or if you were a florist and every flower you delivered was wilted? Can you imagine how you'd feel? It would be a miserable existence. Can you imagine how you feel sitting on one side of the decks and, and dishing out bags full of pills and what you see every visit is fat, sick, suffering people? Can you imagine how you would feel as a doctor? Well, the doctors want to change, too. Uh, doctors, I believe, went to medical school. And dietitians went to their training to help people. I know that. But we got lost along the way by, by money, by the drug companies, the heart surgery companies, the, the, the cancer center in your town, the heart surgery center in your town. They got lost along the way in the money. But they still want to do good things. Can you imagine how good I must feel as a doctor? When, when I met some of you here, you told me uh, what, what uh, Mary and I did to help you change your life. Can you imagine how the good... I know some of you came up to me and you said, I'm sure you're tired of hearing this. No, I'm not. <laughs> Tell me again. I, it makes me feel so good that I know I helped you. That's what I want to do in life, and so do the other doctors. But they were just given tools that don't work. So what you do is you keep your seven-minute office visits. 
you gotta run them through, you know, to keep the cash register going. But what you do is you say to the patient when they come in, just like I do in my practice, is you tell them, look, we need to stop these, uh, these diabetic pills, they'll kill you, here's the research. Uh, the aggressive treatment of diabetes has been shown, by the way, Cochrane came out uh, uh, last month and said that there's no evidence that treating blood pressures below 160 over 100 with drugs saves lives. That's what the Cochrane Collaboration said. Of course, the British guidelines for the last decade, the British government guidelines, the National Health Service has told their doctors not to start people on blood pressure pills unless their blood pressure is 160 over 100 or greater for months. Yet doctors in this country, they want to catch it in time. You get a slight elevation of blood sugar, blood pressure, they get you on the drugs just so we can catch it in time. All right, so, um, so what you do is you, you run the seven minute office business as you usually do. And then what you do is, uh, is you educate, you have classes on Saturday morning or Tuesday afternoon, and you teach people in a group setting how to be well. You take them shopping, you take them to healthy restaurants, you show them how to cook. You teach them how to, very inexpensive compared to what we're doing now. And they get well, and they get off the drugs, and they stop coming to see the doctor, and now the doctor has more time, and the insurance company's just shoving the money in their pocket. And employers like GM that spends $1,500, $1,500 for a car, each car goes to health care of their current and retired employees. So GM goes, hey, now I can compete with Toyota, because I don't have to spend all this money on my sick employees and the retirees. So the companies are happy. Everybody's happy except those who continue to do the old ways. You know, just like the Germans I told you about this morning. 400,000 of them starved to death because they wanted to keep doing the old ways. The people in Denmark, thanks to Hinhidi, they did things like we're going to have to do in the future if we're going to win. I know a lot of you are, are, are depressed about what's going on in the world today. I, I am too sometimes. You know, you can get all, let all this get down on you about... Uh, overpopulation and global warming and destruction of the oceans and devastation of the animals and so on. It can really give you a bad day. But uh, I can't live that way. I can't get up in the morning and say that we're going to lose. I have to get up every morning and say we are going to win. And I know we can win. We can win because of your efforts and my efforts and the truth. And lots of changes have to be made. But this planet is worth fighting for. And we must put all of our effort into it. And if we can get the money on our side, we can really win. So that's how you get the money on your side. Now you got one other problem, and that's the specialists. Okay, the specialists, you know, the, the, the real doctors, the experts. <laughs> uh, my, my son just uh, finished his medical school and he's now a board, board certified internist, practicing in Portland at Kaiser. Which by the way, I think Kaiser's a very good system, so don't misinterpret what I'm saying. I'm just trying to give you some examples. I think Kaiser is probably our best hope. Uh, to the Kaiser system. Uh, where was I going? Specialist. specialist. <laughs> God, I'm a specialist. You know, almost everybody in my son's class became a specialist. Nobody wants to be a GP. Nobody wants to uh, be a family practitioner or an internist. They all want to be specialists because that's where the cash is. As a heart surgeon or cardiologist, you make on average a half a million bucks a year. If you're non-interventional, you're lucky if you do 250. So what do you think the students are gonna do? They're gonna go and become a lucrative specialist. It only makes sense. Self-preservation, survival is what they're gonna do. All right, here's what we do to the specialists. We don't have any of them in our new system. We have no cardiologists working for us. We have no kidney specialists. We, have these we don't even employ them. They're out of the system. All right, so that's because you've got to control costs, and these people don't know how to control themselves. So we won't allow them to work for our health care system. Absolutely unacceptable. We have family practitioners, internists, general practitioners, basic OB, pediatric, pediatric doctors. That's our system. That's it. Period. Boom. Or right, what if somebody needs a specialist? No problem. Just go down the street and hire a specialist. Hire them for their tools. That's all they're good for. Hire them to poke a catheter in somebody or stick a tube up somebody's butt or something. That's a, basically all they are is just, just technicians. Hire the suckers. But do not let your patients go alone. They need protection. So if that patient has to go see a specialist, 
uh, uh, somebody from the system is sent with them to, to help them, to guard them from these powerful people. These are extremely powerful people. You know, the smartest and, and most influential people in the world are physicians. They are the cream of the cop. Uh, it is such a privilege to be a doctor. You are selected uh, into medical school as being one of the most, uh, most potentially great people in the world. I've been through that selection process twice for myself and once for my son. I know how it goes. It's tough to get into medical school. So uh, being the best people around, they have the potential to do the greatest good and the greatest harm. And unfortunately, too often they do great harm to patients. They justify it, sure, they justify it. You know, we were just talking a few minutes ago uh, with an anesthesiologist that's here. And he knows this conversation, he knows how it works. <clears throat> you sit there in surgery, you're the anesthesiologist, and you're working on a, a prostate removal or something, and the urologists, the urologic surgeons are sitting there arguing about why the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force is such a bunch of jerks. And they came to the wrong conclusion, recommending that we don't do PSA tests and that we limit aggressive surgery greatly. You, can't, you, cannot, you cannot control these people unless you control the money. So anyway, the patient goes with protection. If you go to the hospital, one of our uh, guardians will go with you too. Why? Because I can make a lot more money for my insurance company if I have somebody at your bedside making sure they don't order six CAT scans in six days and give you unnecessary drugs, a whole bucket of them all day long. I can, make a, I can pay for that assistance sitting by the bedside 20 times over. So we'll have guardians for everybody in my health insurance company. Yes, we will. And uh, once, once the success is seen, once your friends and relatives see that your insurance company is there to protect you, and it's really health, health insurance. They're trying to get you healthy, then your neighbors are going to join. You can't, you can't, you've been through this. I know you have. You, you've uh, lost the 50 pounds. You, people go up to you and say, what, did you get plastic surgery? You look so young. Uh, you've had that reaction to people. Can you imagine when your friends and relatives can see you get healthy? You say, well, it's because I belong to this insurance company. And how much do you pay for insurance a month? Well, I only have to pay $150 a month instead of 400 a month. I don't have to pay 150 a month. Oh, tell me more. But, but, but what do I have to do? Well, I have to become healthy. Let's see, I save $250 a month and all I have to do is get healthy. Oh, okay, well you can imagine the people that sign up and you can imagine the companies, the businesses across the country like GM and Ford and IBM and Apple and so on, when they can look at their employee base and they can say, we have a lean, functional, healthy employee base People that are not thinking about their stomach all the time. You know, they've done studies on, on people and they've asked them, employees ask them questions. How often do you think about your intestines, your indigestion, your stomach aches all day long? And they think about it all day long. You don't want your employees to think about their high blood pressure or worry about their PSA tests or worry about when their next bowel movement is. You don't want that your employees thinking about that. You want your employees thinking about the job. You want your employees not only to work in their, in their usual prime years, but you want your employees to work in the years that I'm at. What a great loss to our society to have people sit my age retire because they have to or they're sick. They have to, what a loss to our society. You know how much I know, how much I've learned in 44 years. You're gonna have to spend 44 years to learn that. And I'm willing to share it and I know you as business people as engineers, as artists, you have the same talent. If you're healthy enough to give it back, uh, we cannot lose the old people in our society. We'll lose our society if we do. We'll lose our competitive advantage. We won't be able to compete around the world and succeed. We're talking about creating all these jobs and becoming economically prosperous. It's impossible now because people are so sick. So anyway, that's, that's the way I would do it. Uh, if I ever have a chance, if I ever get a chance to live long enough, if I ever get somebody that was with a similar vision, I want to go where the money is. I can beat them. I know I can. If they give me a platform, if they give me a, just a little chance, I can beat them. Right now, I don't get any chance because, uh, you know, that's just the way it is. All your friends know that you'd get sick if you didn't eat dairy and meat. And everybody knows mammograms and PSA tests and heart surgeries, you know, the cat's meow. Everybody knows this. It's common knowledge. 
So when the truth comes out, it gets quickly buried. Unless, of course, I had the money to the dairy industry and the meat industry, and uh, who are all those guys that advertise, uh, those uh, companies that advertise on 60 Minutes? Uh, let's see, 60 Minutes is on tonight. If you watch their commercials, all, you know, everybody needs something for erectile dysfunction, and you're all depressed, and you need pills for that. And if I had their money, can you imagine what I could do? Yeah, it would be just amazing if I had their money and I could tell people the truth. Uh, I think there's hope, I really do. I'm not trying to give you a pessimistic message. Uh, we have to have a different future, I believe. We cannot go back, we must go forward. And part of that going forward is to fix our problems. If you think the healthcare system in this country is fair, if you think it's fair, then you're not interested in what I have to say. If you think clean coal is the answer and we're going to power our way into the future, then you don't want to listen to me because that's not the future I'm talking about. I'm talking about doing the right thing and to giving, giving our planet and our children a chance. That's what I'm talking about. We cannot go back. We must move forward. And we are right. We are a nugget of information that everybody needs to know. I believe that. I hope you believe that. I hope you will fight. You will do everything necessary, including identifying this as good and evil and showing the pictures of these disgusting people in a video to your friends. Why not? My children's future is at stake. I don't give a damn about embarrassing somebody. I don't care about being politically correct. I don't even care about being a nice person. And you can think about me that way, and I don't really care. <laughs> but I'm not going to I'm not going to stop doing just like the other speakers here, just like all of you who dedicated your weekend to be here. You know that we cannot let our guard down for a minute. There's too much at stake. We must win. And there's no sacrifice that's too great to win. And uh, that's what I think. Do you have any questions? <laughs> well, I, just, I, just, I just want to be Surgeon General. That's all. I want to be Surgeon General. Regina Benjamin got my job. I, by the way, I've invited our obese Surgeon General to my clinic on several occasions. I just would like to be Surgeon General. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do as Surgeon General. The first thing I'm going to do is uh, you will no longer be able to buy uh, infant formula at CVS Pharmacy or Safeway. You must go to the doctor and beg for a prescription, just like you would narcotics. And if you write as a doctor a prescription for it, you'll be reviewed by a medical ethics board to see whether you're not you're practicing good medicine. That's the first thing I'm going to do. Second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put labels on supplements that say things like vitamin E will give you heart disease, and beta carotene will increase your risk of cancer, and vitamin A will destroy your bones, and folic acid will increase your risk of dying of cancer and heart disease. I'm going to put warning labels on all the supplements. Yes, I am, and I know you don't like that. That's the second thing I'm going to do. Oh, well, I mean, I could go on all day long. I'm going to help the kids, too. I'm going to start with the kids, because there's no excuse for allowing the kids to be sick. Yes? Just to continue, just to continue, where do I go to sign up for insurance? <laughs> yeah, well, I'd love, you know, I mean, it would be a great idea. I've been talking about, I've been working on this uh, since 1999. As I say, I took care of the employees of Blue Cross Blue Shield for three years. Uh, we, ran, uh, we ran a very good study on this. We showed that we could cut the health care costs based on their claims data by 44% in a year. You know, I mean, it's just obvious, clear, and so on. Uh, the, the problem is, is that uh, it's just inertia for people. Back 13 years ago, fewer people understood what vegan meant or vegetarian or plant foods, and you know, things have changed. So maybe we're in a different climate now. And uh, even though I've talked to companies like we're working with Whole Foods now, and I've uh, worked with public supermarkets in the past, they just don't have the vision they just can't see, I mean, Whole Foods, I, I have to take that back, Whole Foods is extremely progressive and has done wonderful things. Uh, but my, you know, previous times of working with companies, they just couldn't see, they wouldn't believe anybody would change their diet, they didn't have faith in their employees, they didn't think we could get people to change their diet, they couldn't realize the cost savings, they were afraid. They're afraid, that's, the, that's one of the big problems, is people are afraid. Uh, people are afraid 
uh, patients are afraid. They're afraid not to do what the doctor recommends. Doctors are afraid to do anything different. They're afraid uh, if they do something different, they'll get criticized by their colleagues and they'll be sued. The reason you will lose a lawsuit in this country is if you fail to practice the community standard of practice. <clears throat> in other words, you can kill the patient the same way the guy down the street does. That's okay, because you'll win in the court of law because you, you abided by the community standard of practice. So your physicians are afraid to do the right thing. Everybody's afraid. It's called fear-based medicine. And it's also called faith-based medicine because you must believe it works. You as a patient must believe it works because there's no evidence it does. You see no benefit. You see none of your friends getting healthy. Your doctors must believe it works because the scientific studies say it does not work. They must believe it's faith-based medicine. We must stop believing. We must stop being afraid. We must do the right thing. And if there's enough money behind it, I know we can do the right thing. We just need, we just need some people with vision who want a different future. It's easy to do. I've been doing this for 44 years. This is easy. I could do this in my sleep. I could set up this program in any town, in any city, in 72 hours. I'd grab Doug Lyle and Jeff Novick and Michael Clapper and a few of the other great people you've heard here, and I'd tote them off to Chicago. We'd run the program around in Santa Rosa in 72 hours. This is, this is a no-brainer. I'm sure half of you people in here could run this program. You know, what does it take to tell somebody to eat potatoes and corn? <laughs> And I know the doctors are afraid to take them off the pills. The pills are making them sick. The first thing I do when I take care of people at my clinic, the first thing I do is I get them off every drug I possibly can. It takes me about three days before I sleep well at night until I get these people on the minimal amount of medication and I know that they're going to be okay. It's the simplest, safest thing to do, but you're afraid. Yes. You said something about getting everyone off of every medication. My specialist told me that I would never be able to get off of um, a thyroid replacement for Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Is no, that true? There are true? medications. The question is, can you get off medications, all medications? The answer is absolutely not. You know, I mean, there are some medicines, there are some really good things in medicine. If I get in a car accident and I end up in the intensive care unit, don't bring in a, mashed potato, a bowl of mashed potatoes and carrots. <laughs> I want the drugs, I want the surgery, I want everything modern medicine. Modern medicine is wonderful acute for acute problems. There are some, I'll tell you the drugs I prescribe. I prescribe thyroid supplementation, because a lot of people, particularly women, about 20, 30 percent of them in the 30, 40 year old age group have thyroid issues, a lot of men do too. I know why it is, I know what causes it, but once the thyroid's damaged, it's, it's too late, so they have to be thyroid supplement. I uh, give blood pressure pills with people who have blood pressures that exceed 160 over 90 for long periods of time. I prescribe chlorothaladone, which is dirt cheap. That's why it's not prescribed. It's almost free. Uh, for diabetics, I give uh, diabetics, all type 1 diabetics, insulin. Type 2 diabetics, I give them insulin, long-acting lantus, one shot a day. If they lose too much weight, develop symptoms of diabetes, they worry about their numbers. Uh, let's see what else do I give. I give hormone replacement therapy on occasion to women. I give, uh, well, let's see, pain pills, I give some aspirin, and uh, there's not many things I prescribe. But everything I prescribe is uh, very inexpensive, time-honored, and has a solid scientific background that shows me I'll do more good than harm. I want to tell you one of the drawbacks, if you decide to be a doctor, <clears throat> I probably shouldn't go there, but I will. No, I shouldn't. <laughs> Uh, one, of the, one of the perks you'll lose is the, the sexy drug sales ladies coming into your office to sell you drugs. So pardon me, Mary, but uh, thank God you're a beautiful woman and I get all the stimulation I want from you because I haven't seen a drug rep in 30 years. So, now I'm getting based, so I better get off stage. Did, did anybody else notice that it was like a little more peaceful before John got here at this conference? John McDougall, thank you very, very much. Thank you.